Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth and final part of the demonstration for the angle plate project for Machine Technology 210. This is the final installment in our grand epic quest to make a precision L bracket, as it were. Um, we are going to be doing steps 22 through 28, the final steps on the project planning worksheet. And we're going to start on this project or this final stage of the project by finishing our data may reference surface. Okay, so let, let's zoom up here uh, a little bit closer and talk about the, the sequence of operations that we have to follow here in order to establish the final inspection criteria for orientation relationships between all the surfaces. So here's the print. This is the, the, you know, the print that we're beholden to in terms of uh, geometry and final uh, inspection criteria here. Um, and so we are about to start machining down our final size dimensions, okay? So that's, there are really only five of them, right? Two inches, 400, one inch, 880, two inches, 130. Those are the overall size dimensions. And then we have 500 thou and 630 thou for these wall thicknesses. Um, the radius we already put in, that was the size of the reamer. So, I mean, that's done. So really we're only uh, responsible for like five dimensions on here, okay? But there are also some other criteria that are not specified by the size dimensions. And that's this geometric dimensioning and tolerancing that we already talked about um, during the lecture portion of this project. So that includes this system of datum references and a bunch of these feature control frames, these boxes that have symbols and tolerances and datum references inside of them, okay? So because of the way that this is dimensioned, okay, uh, we have to follow a certain sequence or it's best for us to follow a specific sequence. We don't have to, but it's easier if we do. So if you look at all of these feature control frames, right, this one, this one, this one, uh, they are all in reference to datum A, datum A, actually this one's datum B, but the surface which is datum B is referenced to datum A. And datum A is the bottom of the part right here. This big broad surface, which is two inches, 400 thousandths by two inches, 130 thousandths. That's our datum A. And we have this datum feature control frame here, this flatness of one thousandths. That's the tolerance for datum A. That's telling us that the form of this datum feature, the bottom of the, of the part, the actual bottom surface of the part right here, that needs to be flat within one thousandths of an inch, okay? And that's because if it's going to be used as a datum reference, uh, you know, it would be good if it were, you know, of a reasonably, I mean, it can't be a perfect form, but we'd like it to be relatively close, okay? So it's very common that you see this uh, form control being specified for a, a surface which is called out as a datum feature, okay? Uh, that little flag right there is what indicates that this is datum feature A. And then this surface right here, the, the 90 degree perpendicular surface is called out for perpendicularity within one thousandths to datum A. Sorry, that's this surface. This surface has to be perpendicular to this one within one thousandths of an inch, okay? Um, and then this surface here also needs to be perpendicular to datum A within a thousandths of an inch. So that's this surface. So both, both this surface and this surface need to be perpendicular to datum A. This surface here, the one on top uh, on the camera, that one becomes datum B. And then datum B is referenced over here. So this surface has to be parallel to datum B within one thousandths of an inch. Okay? So this is datum B, this surface over here has to be parallel to datum B within a thousandths of an inch, okay? So basically, if you follow this chain through the print, you'll see that datum A is really the most important surface and everything sort of gets called out to that. Now you'll also notice that this surface, this surface, the inside surfaces, they are not called out in terms of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Their forms and orientations are not called out. Uh, to any other reference on the, uh, on the part, except that 
uh, they have to meet these size requirements, okay? But that's two decimal places, plus or minus 10 thousandths according to our uh, tolerance block. That's, you know, no big deal right there, okay? But as it is right now, these are the only two finished surfaces, uh, fl finished flat surfaces on the part. So we do have to reference them um, at least when we make data may, because we're going to be simultaneously finishing this width or this thickness, rather, to 630 thousandths at the same time that we establish a flatness for datum A. And then when we're establishing this surface right here perpendicular to datum A, we're simultaneously establishing the 500 thousandths uh, size requirement here for this uh, wall thickness. Um, so that means that these two surfaces have to be oriented reasonably well to these two surfaces, simply so that we can hit those size dimensions, right? Because if they're really out of perpendicularity, or sorry, if they're really out of parallelism to, their, uh, to the sides opposite, right? So if this surface here is really out of parallelism with data A, then it's going to be really hard to meet the size requirement everywhere on the surface, right? So there's a little bit of a built-in orientation tolerance when it comes to the size dimensions, okay? It, it also says that you know, if this surface is like really, really, really out of whack for whatever reason, it came out with a very poor flatness, okay, that could also cause some problems in terms of hitting this size dimension. So there's actually something in geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, the GD&T standard, uh, called rule number one. Rule number one basically says that the size dimension already has a built-in control for form and orientation, depending on what the size dimension is and how it's specified. Um, and so any geometric dimensioning and tolerancing control is going to have to be a refinement of whatever is already specified by the size dimension. And, uh, just a little thing that we won't really go over, but later on uh, you know, in these courses, we'll definitely touch more upon that particular concept. Okay. So, sequence of operations, according to the uh, project planning worksheet, but also just logically, is that we finish data A first, get it flat and to this size dimension. Then we come over here and finish this surface, which is the 90 degree perpendicular surface to data A, get it perpendicular and get it down to 500 thousandths. Then we come over here and we do uh, this surface, which becomes datum feature B, perpendicular to datum A, and then we do this surface over here and get it parallel to B and down to the 2 inches 130 dimension. Then we still have two more surfaces that need to be finished that you can't forget about, and that's this little surface here and this little surface here. The small surfaces uh, on the tips of the two L's, or the, the tips of the L, <laughs> okay? And those have to be finished down to our overall size, 2 inches 400 thousandths and 1 inch 880 thousandths, okay? But there are no, you know, geometric dimensioning and tolerance and controls on there. It's just a size dimension, no big deal, okay? So let me go ahead and label the part. The labeling scheme is going to come from this sheet right here. That's sheet 4 of 5 uh, on your print. And it's just because it starts becoming difficult to define all of these uh, surfaces, right? So we just lettered them, okay? So this right here is going to be surface A, which makes sense because it's going to be datum A, okay? Um, this surface right here is going to become surface C, the side perpendicular to datum A, okay? This one right here is going to become surface B, which also makes sense because it's going to become datum feature B. And then over on the other side here, we're going to do datum D, or not datum D, but surface D. Okay, you can't really see it because of the dicum there. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to finish off surface H. And what is this? This is surface G. Okay. In that order. Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, number 22, machine surface A to the 630 uh, thousandths dimension, that uh, wall thickness. We're going to use a two and a half inch fly cutter, which I will discuss in just a moment. But first, let's go ahead and fixture the part. 
Okay, let's get this into a slightly better spot here. Okay, so these were the parallels that we had in there from last time. They're the one and three eighths of an inch parallel uh, parallels. And I think those are going to be appropriate for this as well. Yep, because we're gonna hold the part something like this. Uh, so basically flipping it uh, 180 degrees from the way that it was held before when we we're doing the uh, the inside surfaces So that sort of stick out of the part is still appropriate um, And so for this first side for um, surface a we're just going to tamp this down onto the parallels right so that we are registering off of that uh, surface that we finished on the inside uh, just so that it can be sitting square enough for us to get down to that 630 thousandths dimension Okay, the one thing you need to worry about is depending on exactly where you put the part sort of uh, left to right on here as it's hanging off uh, the side of the vise, is that if you put it in too far, then the corner of the parallel, okay, is going to be intersecting the radius, right? So then what you're going to be doing is uh, well, when you tamp this down, first of all, you're probably going to score the inside of the, the hole with the edge of the parallel, which is hardened steel. Um, but the other thing that's going to happen, if you just look at what happens here, if you tamp it down so that it's contacting the parallel in, an, in two spots, then it's going to be kicked out at an angle like that. Okay, And that's not what we want at all. right? So you just need to make sure that you put the parallel or you put the part down on the parallel so that only this flat inside surface is actually contacting the parallel. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Also need to make sure that this is clean. Something like that, and then this goes right there, hanging off the end of the vise right over here. It's not ideal, but it's what we've got to work with. Okay, hold that down on the parallels, tighten it down. Okay, hit it with the hammer. Okay, neither parallel is moving. That's good. These are fly cutters. Uh, you can see that they come in different sizes. Their construction is, yeah, pretty much the same. It scales up and down pretty easily. Um, so these are really just glorified tool holders. So you can see on this one, there's a straight shank portion, there's a main body, uh, some set screws, uh, a slot, and then it just holds a, a basically a lathe tool, right? Um, and so this is the cutting edge right there. And let me just move these out of the way. And the way that this works is, you know, you've got a little cutting edge here, and then it just spins around like so in the spindle. And that cutting edge inscribes a circle, and that's, you know, basically that's the cutter right there, right? And so that's what defines the actual geometry of this cutter, right? So how far from the center of rotation is that cutting uh, edge right there, the tool nose on the tool. So just judging by that rough estimate, that's like, I don't know, it's sticking out about two inches from the center of rotation. So the effective size of this cutter is actually two inches times two, because two inches is the radius. So that's gonna be inscribing that cutter geometry uh, the, the effective cutter diameter is going to be something like four inches. Now, that's more than we need, right? Um, we only really need, well, let's see, a little bit more than uh, this surface here. And actually, we're looking for not just this direction, that's about two and a half inches, right? But we're also looking for it to traverse this entire area. So that's actually about three and a quarter is what we need from, from uh, corner to corner three and a quarter. Uh, so basically, we, we can make this a little bit smaller, okay? 
So we could move it a little bit closer. Let's see, will that, well, actually it's going to intersect. The, uh, the cutting edge right there is gonna intersect with the side of the fly cutter. So this fly cutter really can't be made much smaller than this, okay? So we're just gonna have to live with it. Um, we could, of course, go with the smaller fly cutter, like this one. Well, yeah, we could go with this one. Anyway, I'm just gonna go with this cutter right here. It's, you know, a little bit beefier. I already, you know, ground the, uh, the, the cutter, you know, the cutting edges on here, so it's ready to go. So you, you could use a smaller fly cutter if you wanted to. Basically, I'm just gonna have to spin this a little bit slower, essentially. So you can see the straight shank portion on here is not gonna be a direct fit into the spindle. So we need some kind of intermediary, and that is this uh, R8 collet three-quarter inch R8 collet because this shank right here is nominally three-quarters of an inch. That just fits on there. So this has those drawbar threads on the end of it, um, and it's got an R8 taper on it, right? And so as this gets sucked up into the taper, it squishes the three-quarter inch shank on the fly cutter, and so that friction is what actually holds this in. So it's actually not that secure of a, of a mounting method. Um, you know, so it, it can move, you know, the fly cutter can actually move in and out of the collet ever so slightly, but we're going to be taking very, very small cuts with this, so uh, I'm not terribly worried about it. Okay, you got to make sure that everything is nice and clean up in that spindle and on the taper here. Go ahead and put that in first. Oh, where's that key? There it is. Okay, so that goes in first and uh, engage the drawbar thread so that it's at least partially engaged, okay? Um, then we're gonna put this up into the shank and tighten that down as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and tighten it with a three quarter inch wrench. Put the brake on. Okay, that looks pretty good. There's actually something that's really worth mentioning here, and that's that if you look at the fly cutter, it should be readily clear that uh, it is an inherently unbalanced tool. Um, that means that, uh, well, in two ways, really. One is that the mass distribution on either side of the fly cutter is unbalanced. There's more material on one side than the other, but also because there's only a single cutting edge, uh, the cutting forces are also going to be unbalanced, right? Uh, and so this means that fly cutters, the entire family of the fly cutting tool, uh, is notorious for exciting vibrations in the machine. Okay, and that's going to lead to chatter. It's going to lead to, you know, those weird wavy patterns in the part. Uh, it can lead to poor surface finishes. It can lead to uh, damaging the cutting edge and prematurely wearing it. So it's important that you monitor the cutting conditions for this vibration, and you may need to adjust the spindle speed on the fly, either up or down basically just to get outside of that spindle speed where it's making that vibration. And usually it means reducing the speed, but sometimes increasing the speed can also help. And so even though we went through all that trouble to calculate the appropriate spindle speed and feed rate for this cutter, or for any cutter, um, it's important to remember that the cutting speeds and feed rates are only recommendations. Right? So we based the spindle speed and uh, the, consequentially the feed rate off of the diameter of the cutter and off of the surface feet per minute uh, given to us in the chart in the operations manual. Um, but how did they arrive at that surface feet per minute? Right? I mean, that number is actually just something that somebody came up with because they took a similar cutter and ran it at a bunch of different speeds in a bunch of different materials and figured out what the best, you know, middle of the range uh, surface feet per minute was to get good productivity but not prematurely wear the tool, right? But they were basing it off of sort of ideal cutting conditions and depending on the rigidity of your setup, you may actually need to change... Uh, those numbers on the fly. It's important to know what the calculation is, but don't just base everything off of that, right? I mean, that's not written in stone. You can change it around, and frequently you will need to in a real-world machining application. Let's touch off on the surface and take a cut.
just going to center the center the spindle on the on the part here. Okay, I'm going to raise the knee up a little bit. You know, we want to minimize our quill stick out. That's a good way to, you know, keep from having too bad chatter here. And uh, we still have a little bit of room here. So I'm going to bring it a little bit closer with the quill, but I'm not going to touch off in this way, okay? With the fly cutters, because they have that one cutting edge, uh, you know, it's, it's not really an appropriate... So static touch off is not really an appropriate way to touch this tool off, just because of its geometry, right? It's, it's design and construction. So we're going to do a dynamic touch off, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on to the speed which you should have calculated. I won't tell you what it is. Okay. I'm going to slowly raise it up, raise the knee up, okay, until I just, oh, you can see it's touching there. You hear it touch off. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and take a, uh, I'll take five thousandths. I'll adjust the speed. We're going to have to spin this really slow, right? Because this is, uh, it only has one cutting edge, right? And so we have to feed it really slow to get a decent finish. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and set that now, moving the part away from the tool. Too fast. There we go. All right, and now I'm going to take that cut. So why are we using the fly cutter instead of the octomill, right? Well, the fly cutter, as you can see, is adjustable in its size, and we can make it big enough to cover this entire machine surface in one pass instead of having to zigzag it, right? If we zigzag the cutter, we always run the risk of having like a little bit of a a little bit of a step, right? Oh, that's kind of hot. We always run the risk of having a little bit of a step where the two zigzags meet, okay? Um, or where the two surfaces meet in the zigzag. And so this is just a good way of, you know, getting rid of that potential source of uh, error by cutting everything in a single pass, right? Now, we're not going to let the fly cutter cut on the back side. We're only going to let it cut on the forward cut. Okay? So I'm going to stop it once it completely cuts that surface. So the other thing is that some of these tools here, you can see that the way that this tool is oriented, it needs to spin. Um, so depending, if you're looking down at the spindle, it has to spin clockwise. Okay? Clockwise like this in order to lead with the cutting edge. Okay? But some of these are actually oriented backwards, right? So you could have a, a tool that has a cutting edge over here, and then you would have to spin it counterclockwise. So you really have to pay attention to this, okay? You really do. The other nice thing about this is that you can just rotate this out of the way and then move the part, and then that allows you to not have to change anything uh, when you move the part out of the way, but you're also not... Um, you know, you're also not uh, dragging the tool across that surface, so that's kind of nice. Okay, let's go ahead and measure that with a micrometer now, so we know exactly how much more we have to take. There we go. Okay, go ahead and lock that down, and then pull it out. And it's telling us 625 plus 10. So 635,000. So we only have 5,000 to go. Okay? That's not very much. Take another 5,000 cut. Okay? The most that you really want to take with these fly cutters at this stage of the game is like 10,000. You know, I mean, you can take more, but you know, that, that's a nice small number. You know, you're going to get a decent finish. Now, this is actually coming out just a little bit. It's not coming out as well as I would hope. Okay? And that could just be because you know, even though this, uh, this cutter looks, uh, looks good, you know, uh, just by naked eye and, you know, you know, I did the little fingernail test where you drag the fingernail over the cutter and it, it looked pretty good. It could be that it's just slightly worn. It just has a slightly folded over edge uh, right on the cutting edge. 
And so then, you know, that's really where it matters. And so it wouldn't be giving us a perfect surface here, surface finish, I mean. Okay. So I think it's going to be okay. You know, there's not really a surface finish call out on this part. It would be nice to be a little bit nicer than that. Uh, what I'll do is I'll spin this up a little bit faster when I take this cut, and we'll see if we can get that surface finish to improve. Spin it up a little bit faster. Okay, now I'm going to go up my five thousandths on the knee. And then this is going to be the final cut. Get it a little bit closer. Okay. No, surface finish looks about the same. So what I'll do is I'll actually go and uh, re-grind this tool, all right? And uh, then we'll see if it cuts a little bit better. Yeah, so that surface finish is not a whole lot better. Yeah, may even be worse. So let me go ahead and take this thing out, and I will regrind it. I'll regrind it and try again, and we'll see if we can get it to improve. Okay, so there we have it. Um, pretty easy to grind, nothing really major there, just touch up all the surfaces. You know, it's carbide, right? So you've got to use like a green silicon carbide wheel, or you have to use a diamond wheel in order to grind this down. Um, you know, that, that appears to be pretty gosh diddly darned sharp, so let's see what it does. I'm going to shorten that up just a little bit. I'm going to have to touch off again, of course, because I, well, first I raised the quill, right? So I lost the position anyway, but also, you know, the, the position of the cutting edge has changed on the tool itself, and the tool was removed from the tool holder Right, and then put back in. So, of course, now I need to go back in and retouch everything. Okay, so let's do uh, another dynamic touch off here. So, get it kind of close with the quill, lock it down, turn it on. I'm gonna slow the speed back down a little bit. Okay, slowly raise the knee. So remember that I'm, I should actually already be at my final size, so I'm, I'm going to want to take really almost nothing at all. I'm just going to set it for one thousandth of an inch from where I just touched off. So I probably took a thousandth of an inch uh, when I actually touched off, and so now this is going to be another one thousandth of an inch, two thou total, and let's see what it does. I mean, I don't know if you can see that in the video, but just looking at it right now, I mean, it looks significantly better. Okay, right there. Yeah, we don't let it cut on the backside um, because that can introduce, you know, maybe a little bit of inconsistency in the surface. You know, basically, if it cuts on the backside, there are only two reasons it would do that. One is that your head is out of tram, even slightly. 
Um, or alternatively, it could be because you know, you've just got a little bit of tool deflection. Right? So as this comes around and hits the part, it deflects a little bit upward. But then when it comes around the backside, there's less material there, so it deflects less. And so it kind of takes out that deflection. It's like a spring pass over the surface. Um, you know, no real reason to do that. You usually don't get a very nice uh, finish on that backside, and it can cause other issues like, you know, it could cause just basically rubbing, which would give you a little bit of chatter on that surface. So a couple things that you don't want. And so it's just good practice to only go one way on this. Let's go ahead and measure that surface. Let's measure this surface. Final measurement. I hope, I hope, I hope. Lock it down, remove it. And it says 625 plus two and a half. A little odd. We should be, oh no, 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 that's not odd at all. <laughs> so 625 plus five would be 630, which is what our target was. And then remember I had to go in after I resharpened the tool and took another, so I said I probably took a thousandths when I touched off and then I adjusted it for another thousandths on the knee. And so actually, yeah, that came out to sort of exactly what I expected it to come out to. So 625 plus two and a half is 627 and a half, you know? So 630 plus or minus 10, we're definitely inside of the tolerance here. So I'm gonna call that good. Go ahead and remove this thing. It's got some burrs on it, so we need to remove those. So you can see that's a pretty good finish there, right? There's no surface finish call out on this part, but the better the surface finish, uh, especially on this datum A, um, uh, datum feature A, this surface right here, you know, the better off you're gonna be, right? And, and since it's not really that hard to do with a fly cutter, it's very easy to get good surface finishes. So, you know, just gotta make sure that your tool is sharp. So the next surface that we have to machine is this surface right here, and that's what we're calling surface C, okay? So we're gonna go and machine this one the same way that we machined this surface A right here, but we're going to orient it so that when we machine it, it will come out to 90 degrees perpendicular to this surface here. Uh, let's see, we, we could basically put the part in like this, right? And just clamp it with uh, this new reference surface up against the fixed jaw, kind of like we did when we were um, uh, squaring up the block. But actually, when we're going for something really critical, like a thousandth of an inch, that level of tolerance, then we really want to make sure that our surfaces are aligned in the correct orientation. So we're not going to take any chances, and we're actually going to indicate the part in, right? So we're going to orient the part very similarly to how we took our last cut, okay, hanging off the edge like this, with the datum A, or datum feature A, exposed, go ahead, and, exposed on the right side of the vise, okay? Um, and we're actually gonna indicate this up and down. So the parallels are really just there to kind of give it a little bit of support, but actually you don't wanna worry about being tamped down on the parallels too much. What you're really looking for is that when we indicate datum A up and down, it should be vertical, meaning that the indicator should read zero here and zero here, right? Um, and so that way, if this is straight up and down vertically, when we machine this, uh, this surface right here, then it's going to come out perfectly perpendicular. It's gonna be horizontal, this is gonna be vertical, they're gonna be perfectly perpendicular to each other. Well, I mean, perfectly, you know? Basically, as good as we can get this surface right here, up and down, that's gonna be how far out of perpendicularity this is. Okay, so we're going to use our good friends, the indicator and the indicol. Once again, we will call upon their services here. Okay, flip this around and orient this so that people can see what's going on. 
Okay. Something like that. You know, that 10 to 15 degree angle on the, on the pointer there. Okay, put it into low so that it doesn't uh, rotate too much. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see a little bit better in this position. So the first thing that we need to do here is, uh, so I, I've got this reasonably tight in the vise, okay? You can see the way that the indicator is oriented. All right, now I'm going to bring this up so that we are contacting the surface and zero it out right there. So I'm just, I'm moving the, um, the table on the x-axis, right, left and right. Uh, to get this to zero here at the top. And actually, I'm going to lower the knee a little bit because we really want to be right at the top of that part. Okay. Now, in order to check this up and down, I'm going to rough align it with the quill because the quill is super fast to move up and down. But think about this, okay? If your quill, your quill follows the direction, the angle of your head, okay? And that's, you know, how parallel the angle of the head is to the, uh, the angle of the ways on the knee is dependent on how well you trammed the head, okay? So that's going to be close enough for roughing, but really the best way to get rid of any kind of error coming from your tramming uh, is to just use the knee for up and down indicating, for final indicating, okay? It's a little bit more cumbersome to move that, that knee up and down with the crank, but for final indicating, it's actually quite important that you do that, okay? We don't want to get any error from the tramming of the head uh, involved in this process because it'll kick these surfaces out, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and just move this down with the quill. Okay, and you can see that I'm actually pretty close here, right? It looked like it, okay, so from what counterclockwise, one and a half thousandths, so three graduations. And you can see that if I push the plunger out from the bottom, it goes clockwise, right? So that means that if the plunger is depressed more, meaning that it's, it's pushed more by the surface, it will go clockwise. So if it's going counterclockwise, then it means that the plunger is uh, not being pushed by the surface, which means it's further this way, okay? So that means that the surface, like, okay, so here's the surface. Let's say that I rotate it 90 degrees. The surface is in a little bit like that, which means we need to bring the bottom out to get it to zero, okay? Now, the tools that we're going to use to adjust this in and out um, are, so, for example, if this were reading in the clockwise direction, we would just use our good friend the hammer, dead blow hammer, to adjust it. We just kick it in that way, all right? Um, but in order to move it out, which is what we actually need to do, we're going to use this tool right here. This is uh, an aluminum pry bar, like a kind of shaped like a Klingon bat left. This is just a shot made tool nothing major here, just a way to pry on the back of the part, but because it's aluminum, it won't mar anything, okay? So I'm just going to put this behind, and just gently tap on it, and you know, that's pretty effective at moving this thing around, okay? So now let's check it again. Where are we now? Zero. Wow, pretty gosh diddly darn good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do a full tighten on the vise now. Okay, see if that moved at all. Doesn't really seem to have moved. Okay, but remember, we're not going to trust the quill. We're only going to trust the knee because the knee is what we actually want to use as our reference. Okay, so now I'm going to leave the, uh, the indicator in the same location. Ooh, tightening the quill made the indicator move a little bit. That's interesting. All right, so zero this out, and I'm going to bring the, the knee up for a final inspection. Okay, and it's saying, yeah, a half of a thousandths. Okay. Now, that would actually be good enough, right? 
because we're looking for one thousandth of an inch perpendicularity between the two surfaces. So if this is out a half a thousandth, and just assuming that this is cut exactly horizontal to where the table is right now, then they will be out of perpendicularity by whatever the indicator says, so a half thou, which is within tolerance, right? It was relatively easy to get this the rest of the way there, so let's check this again. You know, in this case, if you can just get rid of as many sources of error as possible, it's pretty desirable. Now, sometimes you can actually see the, uh, the indicator sort of dip a little bit in the center, or maybe like it reads zero here and here, but it reads either high or low in the middle, usually low. And that would be an indication that your surface is domed, or, well, not domed, it's con concave uh, rather than convex. Okay, and that, that just means that this surface isn't perfectly flat. So this is one of those situations in which it's, you know, it's nice to have, like with your datum reference surface, we want it to be, uh, you know, flat to a certain level, in our, in our case, one thousandth of an inch, because we're going to be using it as a reference, right? So uh, good flatness, decent surface finish is going to make it easier on us in the long run, okay? So that didn't move at all, so I'm quite happy with that, okay? Let's get this thing out of here. Raise that knee back up. Okay, so we're pretty close here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back to high gear, making sure that we are actually in gear. Bring it down with the quill just a little bit, you know, so that it's close, but I can still see a gap there. Turn it on. Maybe take it off the part just a bit. All right, bring the, the knee up nice and slow. Can we get that dynamic touch off just as, until it starts pulling a chip? So right there. It's kind of interesting that uh, the cutter is only touching over here and not over here right now, right? So this surface right now is aligned this way, but it's actually askew in this direction. Which actually doesn't matter, right? Because these two surfaces will still be perpendicular and we still haven't cut, uh, it's gonna be this surface right here is gonna become datum feature B, this is surface B right here. Um, this still has to be cut, right? So actually we don't really care what it is in this direction yet on surface C. Um, it's just an interesting thing to point out. Okay, so I'm going to go five thousandths and take a cut. Okay, so that covers the whole surface right there. Turn it off. Okay, without moving the, the quill, just gonna position this so that it's off the surface. Move it back. Okay, let's measure this now. Can be a little bit awkward to get into these uh, small areas. All right, that looks pretty good there. So that says 500 plus eight and a half, something like that. Yeah, we'll take eight, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back on. We need it to go about 8,000, so I'm gonna go 8,000 on the knee. Five, six, seven, eight, right there. And uh, maybe get this a little bit closer. Okay, and then take the cut. Okay, now we've cut the whole surface. Go ahead and stop the feed, stop the spindle. Okay, move this out of the way. Okay, let's take another measurement and see what we came out to. Like that. Okay, 
that says uh, 500 and maybe a half of a thousandth, something like that, less than one thousandth. So we're definitely within the range, okay, plus or minus ten thousandths. Um, now, one thing about this is that remember that we are not really registering on the parallels. I mean, I can actually move the parallels here, right? So we're not really sitting on the parallels. They're just there for like extra support or sort of like rough alignment when we first put this thing in. But we're actually based off of um, uh, surface A right here, right? So actually it's very it's possible and in fact very likely that the surface on the bottom uh, of the part right now that's uh, you know, on the parallels uh, is not parallel to this top surface here, right? So the measurements that we get here, here, maybe a little bit further inwards, uh, probably won't agree. But as long as all of them agree within the size dimension tolerance, then we're good to go, okay? So kind of hard to check that in this orientation, but I will, uh, I'll show you how I do that in just a moment when I take this out. Okay, so that took a little bit longer than expected. This is a pretty junky file, I gotta say. I think I'm gonna have to replace this thing. Um, but it is really, really important that you uh, knock off all these edges and deburr them uh, because you know those burrs are going to influence the way that the part sits in the vise and uh, it's going to cause a lot of problems if you're trying to register off of a surface um, but it's, you're actually sitting on a burr, so it's going to be a big problem. I'll relabel this also. That's C right there. And this was A. So let me show you what I mean by measuring this thing. So if I measure it over here, I get about 501. Okay? If I measure it over here, I get uh, about 500 and a half. If I measure it in a little bit, closer to that radius, actually that's about 500 and a half. So it, it would appear that I did a good job earlier in this process, and so everything is coming out really close, right? But I've had variation as much as 10 thousandths from one side to another when doing this project. And that really doesn't matter, you know, uh, because it, it's kind of, you know, these inside surfaces, it, it kind of depends on, uh, you know, how square the block is at the beginning when you, when you first square it up. That kind of has, it, it actually has a really big uh, influence on how uh, perpendicular these two surfaces are and therefore how um, parallel these surfaces will be when you go to finish the outside surfaces, okay? And so in this case, it came out really close. In some cases, in my, you know, experience, it's come out to like, you know, uh, maybe 10 thousandths total difference, you know, like measuring over here and then measuring closer to the radius. And that just doesn't matter, right? Because the total size dimension is plus or minus 10, right? So we could actually be 20 thousandths of an inch out as long as it was, so this is supposed to be 500 thousandths. So if it were 490 here and 510 up here, that would still be okay. Okay, we are doing pretty well here. We are now going to be on step number 24, which is, again, aligning surface A vertically with the knee and then machining surface B to clean, just to clean, okay? So we have already done these two surfaces. Now it's time to do this surface right here, surface B, which will become datum feature B, okay, that we will cut this side with reference to. Um, but for now, actually, this surface has to be perpendicular to datum A, just like uh, surface C was, right? And so, again, what we're going to do is uh, put this up into the vise with datum A sticking out, datum feature A sticking out on the side, and we're going to indicate that up and down. Okay, we're going to indicate that up and down, just like we did for C, right? I'm going to have to go and move this all out of the way so that I can get that indicator in there. And a couple of other things I'm gonna to have to do, I think I'm gonna to have to replace these parallels because now that part's gonna be sitting a little bit too high in the 
vice jaws for my taste, right? I mean, if, if, it were, if we were to put it in right now on these parallels, it would be sitting right there. And that's not a whole lot of material there to be holding on to. We'd like to hold on to a lot more than that. So I'll get some smaller parallels. Um, and I'm also going to have to change the angle of the camera so that you can see what I'm doing over here. So even though this part is technically tall enough that we could put it directly into the vise and the surface that we need to get access to to cut is still going to be above the top of the vise jaws, we do want to put some parallels under there for this and for the next cut especially for two reasons. One is that the parallels are going to help us uh, orient and align the L-shaped surfaces so that they do come out parallel to one another, which I'll show you in a moment. And then also because we will need to measure the distance between the two surfaces with a micrometer. And so this distance right here is what, we, uh, what we're concerned with, okay? So what is the, the smallest parallel that we can get that will still allow this micrometer to slip in there underneath the part? To me, these one inch parallels seem to fit the bill, right? You can see that that it appears like it just fits, right? So this is what we're gonna use. Make sure everything's really, really nice and clean, parallels included. Okay. Okay, part goes in like this. And actually, in this case, we can position the part in the center of the vise, right? Because we can still get access to data may here. Okay, and now the Indicol. Okay, I'm gonna have to reposition this a little bit. Get enough clearance on the body. Okay, move this in. Okay, then zero out the indicator by moving the x-axis, right, in and out. Right there at the zero. All right, we'll do a quick check with the quill to see how far out it is. Gosh, it looks pretty good. That's about one thousandths in the clockwise direction, okay? Um, so that means that the so the plunger is more depressed on the bottom than it is on the top, okay? And so that means that, so if this is the surface and let's say I kick it out this way, then the part is sitting like that. And so we need to move the top of the part or the top of the surface forward, okay? So an easy way to do this is to hit it with a hammer, okay? Very gently. Not very much. Okay, check it again. It doesn't look like it's moving really at all. Okay, so let me readjust it again to zero and we'll do a final adjustment. Actually, let me go ahead and tighten this down all the way with the vise. Okay. Did it move? No? All right, now I'm gonna move with the knee so that I get a really good reading and I'm not just basing this off of the quill. And you can see that there was a little bit of a difference, wasn't there? Okay, so let me go back up to the top. It looks like it's still a thousandth of an inch out. All right. All right, readjust this. Raise the knee. Okay, and that looks really good. That does not appear to have moved very much at all. 
Now it doesn't move in the center. Let's see. No, not really. So our surface is pretty flat. That's good. Double check it at the top here. Zero everywhere. Okay. I'm going to call that good. Now, we don't care what it is in this direction, right? We only care about it up and down. And you could put your indicator here, 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 wherever it is, as long as in any of those, you know, uh, straight vertical lines, it reads zero. That's all we really care about. Okay, without further ado, let's take a cut. Put this back into high gear. Raise the knee. Wait, move this off a little bit. Turn this around. Make it a little bit easier. This is hard work, cranking this knee up and down. Okay, so we're pretty close now. Bring the quill down just a little bit till it's close. All right, turn this on. Okay, raise the knee up very slowly. Okay, we can see we're just touching there. I'm going to re-zero the dial on the knee crank right there. All right, I'm going to take a cut of uh, five thousandths of an inch, just some minimal cut to clean up the whole surface. And here we go. Okay, as soon as I've cleared the entire surface, I'm going to stop the feed and turn it off. Okay, pop the quill back up. So we cleaned up all the way around. Oh, that's a really nice finish. So we cleaned up all the way around, uh, and that's all we wanted to accomplish here, okay? We're not looking for any sizes. We just want to clean up the entire surface and establish an orientation to datum A. All right, now we can deburr this and flip it around, and we can get our size dimension by cutting that uh, other surface, the L-shaped surface opposite datum feature A, or datum feature B, rather. Okay, go ahead and take this thing out. Okay, deeper this. Really important to deeper it now because because we're going to be relying on this surface sitting flush up against the parallels in order to get the parallelism on the, uh, the opposite surface. Okay, to deburr the inside of that uh, radius right there, um, you know, you can use one of these two tools. Uh, yeah, I guess you could use like a round or half round file in there. Uh, this is a little bit awkward. So you could use one of these like scraper deburring tools, one of these swivel deburring tools. So this one you just, this is kind of nice. You have to uh, watch out for like re-scratching on this surface or on the inside because there are a couple different points on this tool that can actually contact and scratch the surface. Uh, this one, you really just use it like a paring knife, you know, something like that. I actually kind of like this one. It's got a lot more control. Okay, make sure everything is really nice and clean. Like so. Okay. Uh, so the surface that we just cut is going to be going down onto the parallel. So we're just going to flip it over 180, right? Um, now, in order to ensure that this surface is parallel to the bottom surface here, which is what we want, uh, we could very well just tap this down on the parallels and make sure that the parallels don't move. Now, that is going to guarantee that we have the surface parallel this way, okay? But it's not going to guarantee that we have the surface parallel this way, right? Because let's say that this thing is tipped out at an angle like this. Well, if it's touching here and here, the parallels won't move. But obviously, over here, it's not touching, OK? So 
how do we make sure that it's parallel in both directions? Well, I'll show you a little trick. I'm going to use three shims as an intermediary between the part and the parallels. Okay? Uh, by the way, these have to be the same size shim. And of course, how did I verify that? I measured them with a micrometer. Okay? So let me open this back up. So I'm going to put one shim right here under this corner, another shim under this corner, okay, and then another shim under this corner. All the same size. Now when I go in and tamp this down onto the parallels, tighten that vise down, tamp it down on the parallels, now I'm going to be checking to make sure that none of the shims, oh, see, that shim was loose, right? If, if that shim is loose, then that means that uh, the part's not down far enough on this side because it's not sandwiching the shim in between the parallel and the part. What about the one over here? This one's also a little bit loose, okay? So what's happened is that only one side is tight, which means it's sitting out like this a little bit. So I have to hit it a little bit right here, okay? Now, now that one's a little bit loose. Hello. Okay, that one's snug, that one's snug, and this one is snug. So all three of them are snug, meaning <laughs> by snug I mean that uh, you can't move them, right? They are fully sandwiched between the part and the parallel. That means that the part is down on all three of those points, which guarantees that we're good this way and good this way. Well, for three points, this will always work. Um, if you have a bigger surface, you may want to do four points, so four shims. But of course, remember that if you've got four points, then the surface that you're touching on always needs to be flat as well as sitting down on the vise. So if there's any kind of irregularity in the surface, then not all four shims will be touching. But when you have three points like this, it'll always sit on three points, like a tripod, right? And so this always works. Okay. Without further ado, let's go ahead and cut this surface. Okay, so we're pretty close right here. Bring the quill down just a bit, right there. Lock it in. Okay, I'm gonna turn it on. Slowly bring the knee up just a little bit at a time until I can see it just barely take a cut. Shave a little chip off of there. Okay. And I think I'm going to move the uh, I'm going to move the tool a little bit over this way also, just so it's more center on the uh, on the part. Okay, so that was where I touched off. I'll take like five thousandths of an inch right there, and I'll take the cut. This is also just to clean up the surface, right? And then I can take an actual measurement. And uh, that's what I'm going to base the, you know, the final one or two cuts off of. Okay, fly cutters cleared the part. I'm not going to move the quill. Uh, because I want to retain that position, right, because we still have a little bit more to go, but I've got to take a measurement now. So let me check it right here. And what does it say? Okay, it's telling me 2 inches 125 plus 23. So uh, two inches, 148. This is gonna be two inches, 130 when all is said and done. So 240 or 148 minus uh, 130 is gonna be 18 thousandths, okay? So I could probably take that all in one go. Um, I may just take it in two just so I can get a nice little finish. Uh, maybe a 5 thousandths finish on here just so that I can, uh, you know, cause it came out really nice this time and 18 thousandths probably won't come out quite this nice. All right, now one other thing that we can do here is do a quick sort of in-process check for uh, parallelism of the surfaces, right? Where now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure in a few places, here, here, and here, and what I'm looking for is not 
uh, some absolute size, like I was for the size dimension I just calculated a moment ago, but I'm going to be looking for all of those measurements to agree to one another, which would mean that those surfaces um, should be parallel to each other. Actually, it's not a perfect test of parallelism according to the geometric dimensioning and tolerance and control, um, but it's a good in-process check. So let me just double check it over here. Yeah, 148. What do we have over here? Yeah, just a little over 148. What do I get here? Yeah, and 148 and a little bit of change, right? So we're def it looks like we're within a half of a thousandth there, so that's pretty good. All right, let's do this thing. So we're going to go in. Um, I'm going to go, yeah, well, let, let's do a cut of 10 and then a cut of 8. Why not? Here's 10. Okay. And then we still need a cut of, oh, yeah, that's starting to chatter, isn't it? Yeah, it's starting not to look quite as nice as it did before. See, smaller cuts with this, especially over these wide, irregular surfaces, really makes a difference. Okay, I'm going to go my eight thousandths. Okay. Let's check that out. Yeah, it still doesn't look that great. No, but it's probably good enough. Just doesn't like that. Well, actually, it's okay. It's okay. We could take another like little one thousandths cut across that surface if we wanted to, but I don't think it's going to be necessary here. So I took a one thousandths cut anyway. <laughs> And it really did make a big difference. So there's just too much deflection on this big, unbalanced, single-sided tool, you know? So taking that smaller cut really did make a big difference here, and the surface finish is considerably better. Okay, let's check our size. Okay, let's see what we've got. That says, yep. 1 inch 125 plus 4, so 1 inch 129. So we're one thousandths, one thousandths of an inch under uh, our target of 1 inch 130. So, yeah, I mean, that's to be expected because I went in and took another cut of a thousandths of an inch. Tolerance is plus or minus 10 thousandths of an inch, so we are good to go. Okay, we are extremely close now. So we are going to do, let's see, steps number 26 and 27, the last two surfaces, sort of unimportant surfaces really, just this one here and this one here. Um, it's really just to establish these overall dimensions, right? So, you know, we left 15 thousandths on all the surfaces, including these small surfaces that make up the, uh, the tips of the L's. Uh, and so those now need to be finished, okay? No special, you know, process here, really. You can do them in any order, actually, that you want. I'm just going to put it down with uh, datum A on the bottom and do side H here first. I'm going to orient it like this. Just, you know, you can use really any cutter that you want in order to finish this surface. But I've already got the fly cutter in there, so I might as well use that. Um, in order to use that, it's you know, instead of, you know, orienting it this way and taking like a, a long, thin cut, I'm going to take a, a broad, short cut, basically, um, which I think will do just fine. Go ahead and tamp this down on the parallels. Okay, that's it.
That's good. Again, we're going to bring this down a little bit so it's close. Start the tool. Come in, just touch off on side H until I pull a chip. All right. So I'm going to take a cut of five thousandths. Yeah, you saw me, I just moved the, uh, the part a little bit uh, this way so that I could center the cutter up a little bit more. Uh, or, no, sorry, I think I moved it this way. Yeah. Anyway, I moved the table so I could center the cutter a little bit better. All right, let's go ahead and take a measurement off of that. So we're gonna use a one to two micrometer for this because this is supposed to be one inch 880 when all is said and done. Okay, there we go, pull that off. And it says uh, one inch 875 plus 14. Um, so one inch 889. Right, one to 889. So we have nine thousandths to go. Okay, no problem. Nine thou, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, and that's telling me 875 plus five and a little change, so 880. Good. Okay, now it's time for surface G, oriented similar to how we did surface H. Tamp that down. Beautiful. Okay, bring it up a little bit closer. Okay, turn it on. Bring the knee up nice and slow. All right. Let's take a cut of five thousandths again. So this surface is supposed to be two inches 400, and so we're gonna to have to go to the two to three micrometer. Lock that down. So it says two inches 409. Okay, nine thousandths, here we come. Turn it on. Nine thousands, five, six, seven, eight, nine, in the engage. Okay. What have we got? Two inches, four hundred and, uh, I don't know, a half a thousandths. <laughs> Definitely within tolerance. Okay, take the thing out. And there you have it, folks. That is the angle plate, all done. Every surface machined, all the sizes done, all the orientation relationships established. Now, there is the question of final inspection. How do we know that this actually meets all of the final inspection criteria, right? I mean, some of the things we measured, uh, you know, in the machine, I mean, size dimensions we measured in the machine, um, you know, but, you know, we measured it, you know, kind of in awkward positions, and so we may not have gotten a very good reading on it. Uh, and the orientation relationships we didn't measure at all. I mean, the parallelism we sort of kind of measured, but that's actually not 100% appropriate for uh, a parallelism measurement. So 
you know, the perpendicularity measurements we didn't measure at all. We just kind of, you know, indicated everything in and then trusted that that was good enough. Um, so actually, we need to go in and do a final inspection on this thing. Uh, but that is the topic of another video. This brings to a conclusion the demonstration of the manufacture of this little angle plate project. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. Hope you learned something. And I'll see you later. Thanks.